Will you pray with me? Father, you are good to us and we are thankful. We're thankful not only that you've created us, but that you sustain us from day to day and that you have sent Jesus to redeem us, to buy us back from the mess we've made of ourselves and to offer us new hope and new life in Christ. And we're thankful people this morning. Father, as we gather here, we invite your Holy Spirit, your presence, to continue to be with us as we uh, hear from our speaker today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Welcome to session two of the Cheney Bible Lecture Series. If you missed session one, sorry for you, but there is session three at 1 p.m. in Science Hall in the Crow's Nest. Uh, the Cheney Bible Lecture Series was established in 2005 in honor of Albert and Edris Cheney. The Cheneys were deeply committed to Christ and to the sharing of his word. They had a passion for the Lord and a desire to have the truths of the Word of God taught faithfully in their lifetime and for generations to come. So the Cheneys dedicated their lives to the ministry of sharing the saving power of Christ and His Word. And for many years, one of the ways that Albert Cheney served the church and the God that he loved was by serving here on the Central Christian College Board of Trustees. The Cheney Bible Lectures at Central Christian College designed to further the teaching and preaching of the gospel in an academic format, have been commissioned as one way in which the legacy of love for God's word may be continued for years to come. Um, I was uh, told that I was not allowed to introduce the, um, the donors who established the Cheney Lectures series or say their name. They're wonderful people, and if you happen to see people that don't look confused walking around, don't point them to Joe. Just tell them thank you for establishing the Cheney Lectures series, because this has been a blessing to me. I get to hear some great speakers, and one of them, the one you're going to hear today, is actually a dear friend of mine from uh, days at seminary together. I worked for Dr. Joy Moore um, when I was an RA, and she was the director of student life. Let me tell you a little bit about her. Dr. Joy Moore serves as Associate Dean for African American Church Studies and Assistant Professor of Preaching at Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena. Dr. Moore comes to Fuller after four years at Duke Divinity School in Durham, North Carolina, where she served as Associate Dean for Black Church Studies and Church Relations and teaches in the area of homiletics, that means preaching, and the practice of ministry. She was previously Assistant Professor of Preaching at Asbury Theological Seminary Ooh, shout out, okay. And chaplain and director of church relations at Adrian College and held pastorates in the United Methodist Church. Her research focuses on understanding the critical issues influencing contemporary culture for community formation. Um, are you going to be like offended if I don't list all of these books and studies and things? Well, I, I want to go a little bit farther. A little bit? Okay. So she's a native of Chicago, Illinois, and for those of you that don't know where Chicago is, the native of Chicago, right, uh, Moore's desire to teach led her to earn a BA in education and math from National Lewis University. Is it Louis or Lewis? It's Lewis. Yeah, I'm spelled differently. Yeah, okay. National Lewis University in Evanston, Illinois, a Master of Divinity from Garrett Evangelical Seminary in Evanston, and a PhD in Practical Theology from London School of Theology, Brunel University, London, England. Uh, she's an ordained elder in the United Methodist Church. Moore has pastored churches in Michigan since 1988, focusing on cross-racial ministry in urban, rural, and suburban congregations. Um, as a pastor, she's called local congregations to recognize their vocation of glorifying God as a peaceable community, practicing hope, hospitality, and honesty. She's also served as the United Methodist denomination at the general jurisdictional and annual conference level and has reviewed books for the UM uh, publishing house, Abingdon. She's a John Wesley scholar. You know, I could keep going on and on. I could because I have the mic, but I, I won't. I won't keep going on and on. But all that to say, um, the lady that you're about to hear is a big deal. Come on up. the change that I just made as I read um, your uh, theme verse, I'm assuming, for the year from Ephesians. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to work with that 
um, uh, of being the handiwork of God. Uh, but I'm actually going to work at it from something I referenced last night. So those of you who were here last night, you can go to sleep. If um, Glenn's um, um, uh, introduction didn't already put you there, uh, the rest of you, <laughs> the rest of you, um, I, I'm going to ask you to uh, just pray with me as I talk to you for a few moments about refrigerators, resumes, and the rest of your life. God, you have plans for us. We have plans for ourselves. By your spirit, would you intrude in our imaginations that what we dream are your visions for our lives. For as best as we know ourselves, we want to be glimpses of your glory. So let the words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of each and every heart here be acceptable in thy sight. For Lord, you are our rock, in our Redeemer. Amen. Hear these words from chapter 29 of what we call the book of Jeremiah in Christian scripture. The prophet Jeremiah sent a letter to Jerusalem to the few surviving elders among the exiles, to the priests and the prophets, and to all the people Nebuchadnezzar had taken to Babylon from Jerusalem. The letter was sent after King Jeconiah, the queen mother, the court officials, the government leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, and the craftsmen and smiths had left Jerusalem. It was delivered to Babylon by Elisa, Shephan's son, and Gamariah, Halkiah's son, two men dispatched to Babylon's King Nebuchadnezzar, to King Zedekiah. Hold that note. I don't know why, in a day when everything we write, we write is recorded and kept, anybody would dare get on Facebook. But maybe it's because we hope that the messages that we produce will live on as this letter that was written in the days of exile. I heard a memorable message a while back that has stuck in my mind it was entitled, If God Had a Refrigerator, Your Name Would Be On It. Excuse me, Your Picture Would Be On It. Now, those for whom college has caused you to forget the detective monk-style cleanliness of your home kitchen, which you will have to anticipate returning to upon after graduation, let me point this out to you. It is a large, rectangular-shaped object nestled beside your very own stove in the vicinity of your personal kitchen sink. Yes, you will have to once again prepare your own meals, wash your own dishes. Goodbye to ca calculated cafeteria eat and exit strategies. Now, lest you begin to panic at the thought of preparing your own meals and the repeated daily task of washing your own dishes, let me momentarily calm your anxieties. I'm here this morning to tell you about accessorizing the front of your refrigerator, not cooking what's on the inside. By the way, if you ever find yourself standing in front of the refrigerator with the door open, peering inside, it's actually not a moment of memory loss. Rather, it's a long lost recollection of a time when humanity did not look into a stainless steel box for the expiration date on a prepackaged, pasteurized, artificially flavored, low sodium, reduced fat, carbonated, vacuum packed, microwavable Weight Watchers meal. <laughs> Once upon a time, humanity had year-round access to fresh fruit, water that didn't require pipes or plastic bottling, and pesticide-free vegetables at no extra cost. <laughs> of course, that was before Adam and Eve ate themselves out of house and home. <laughs> Which is a reminder that foreclosure on residential premises is not a 21st century phenomenon. <laughs> but I'm not here today to discuss how current political mayhem resembles biblical demonstrations of sin and its consequences. We're here to talk about refrigerators, resumes, and the rest of your life. 
The woman who delivered the message I'm now recalling noted how refrigerators are covered with pictures and photos. But I don't want you to envision your graduation photo. Instead, I want you to go back to your grandmother's kitchen. And there hangs for all of her visitors to see a picture you drew when you were five or six years old that proved to all the world that you are not this generation's Charles Schultz or Picasso. <laughs> You remember that wonderful drawing that she called lovely, artistic, inventive, wonderful, breathtaking, unique, all the while never mentioning that it was your rendering of the tornado that took uh, Toto and Dorothy away. You had 64 colors, and this is what you did. <laughs> Creative, imaginative, memorable. Now, this is a way to understand what it means to be favored, privileged, chosen, by no merit of our own. God gives preferentiality to us, crediting to us righteousness because we believe. John Wesley called that divine grace. Of course, Wesley called everything grace if it wasn't called love. <laughs> God, the hound of heaven, calling out to us while we hide in the bushes, licking our fingers from that rebellious snack of desire, doubt, and disbelief. God, the faithful forgiver, uh, forgetful forgiver who counts as righteousness, our faith in Jesus Christ, uh, that the world is being set right. God, the promise keeper, doing for us what we cannot do for ourselves, demonstrated in Jesus' demonstration to seek and save the lost, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. Those familiar words from Ephesians seem to echo the promise we know so well from the prophet Jeremiah. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says to all those I've carried from Jerusalem to Babylon. I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. But this oft-repeated phrase from scripture is taken from a record of a displaced people. And that's why I read that introduction to the 29th chapter of Jeremiah to remind us that this was a people who had almost forgotten that they were a people of promise. The prophet Jeremiah wants them to remember hope is not a naive, patriotic, and unreasoned expectation that God will swiftly put an end to the power of Babylon and send the exiles back to their homes. Hope was not helping them while forgetting everyone else. Hope is not in God fixing their problems, removing their, pro their trouble, and acting as if their rebellion doesn't have consequences. Godly hope emerges in the painful acceptance that the very reality of Babylonian rule in the present is where we are. Consequently, they had to adapt to their situation and still sing Zion songs in a foreign land. They are in a horrific situation because they wanted to live like everybody else. And God allowed them to be just like everybody else, hopeless, helpless, and hurting. But Jeremiah reminds them that their help comes not from the government, but from God. Their hope is not being like everybody else, but being peculiar in practices of justice, of kindness, and a life that demonstrate that there is a God and God is good. Jeremiah is asking whether they're willing to trust when God is silent. Are they able to stand firm when the earth all around them is sinking sand? Jeremiah's assurances 
point to his listeners to a remarkable and intensive inward religious conviction in a secular context. So I want to suggest that we might do well to think of ourselves as a displaced people, a people scattered into the global context who remember to sing songs of faith in a faithless society, a people whose resume includes a reference to a particular view of the world, a viewpoint that is recorded in the journal of the people of God. Think about it. Here we are, thousands of years later, rereading their ancient equivalent to Facebook. That, that's right, everything from these written transcripts of the spoken messages of the prophet to the PDF files of Paul's prison letters are ancient blog posts. They're sent out through the progressive technological advancement and communication of that day called writing. And don't you believe us when us old folks say whatever you do out there in cyberspace is floating around and going to be there forever. I mean, really, do you think that the uh, Roman officials really appreciated that we still are reading that tweet, tweet that says, can you work up some type of cover story about that stolen body? <laughs> or maybe Peter isn't appreciating that somebody caught on their video phone that exchange he had with that girl by the fire. But let me remind you, Christian scripture is an ordered account of God's actions that make obvious God's intention to set things right even though we keep messing them up. This is our hope, that God is up to something, and this is our future. We have a story that is told generation after generation so that we can remember and know that God is faithful. This God is good that God has a plan to prosper and not to harm you. And God is faithful to complete the good work he began in you. Because from the moment that God paused from the grand symphony of creation to play with a lump of clay, he began this project to form a community, a community with whom the spirit of God so evidently abides that the world will look at us and say, you guys are weird, I mean, <laughs> peculiar. I mean, holy. Because holiness or goodness, according to scripture, doesn't mean perfect in the sense that we speak of pure, unspoiled, faultless. Rather, it means to provide evidence of God's purposes. Not, not our individual plans, not our personal projects born of goals that we claim for God. God's original intention for his creation to glorify himself. God's mission is the reconciliation and redemption of humanity and all creation. And the world in its brokenness, in its hopelessness, in its pain needs to know whether or not God's mission to set the world right again has a community that demonstrates a glimpse of that kind of good, of that kind of hope. That's the task of the church. God has always been forming a people through whom the world would glimpse his glory. Israel in the Old Testament and Christ's followers in the New Testament are both understood in the scriptures to be a called out covenant people of God who testify to the truth of God's promise that what you see now is not what God intends for the world. The ancient prophet Balaam described Israel as a people living alone and not reckoning itself among the other nations. The apostle Paul wrote to the early church not to be conformed to this world. We're not supposed to be like everybody else. We are a peculiar people. God has created us to be holy as he is holy. That's the promise of our resume. The Wesleyans called us transcripts of the Trinity. I, I like to say God paused from that grand symphony of creation to, to confer divinity to some dirt and created a divine facsimile called human beings. That's you and me. 
And, and the, the words of Jeremiah rehearsed long after the children of Israel were released from captivity in Babylon still convey to us today a mandate to be a called out people wherever you're located. So as you move on this next leg of your journey of faith, I warn you, don't seek to make memories. Memories happen. Memories are only the rehearsal of what you've already experienced. You don't need to make them. Instead, follow the prophet's advice. Build a life upon each and every moment. The moment you graduate, the moment you marry, the moment you, your first child enters high school, the moment you're promoted to executive vice president or elected into public service, the moment your congregation builds its 100th habitat house or opens an orphanage for children with AIDS, the moment of the prophet God's words, live life, build houses, settle down, plant gardens, and eat what they produce, marry, have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too will have sons and daughters for we are God's handiwork. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God has prepared in advance for us to do. God's idea of a resume for his people has never been a diploma or a paycheck. It's been God's spirit, evident in a fallen world. That's why the pictures on the refrigerator are not point and shoot photos, but creations of your own hands. The pictures on God's refrigerator are the good works which we do that bear witness in the world of the presence of God's active spirit making a difference in our lives and giving hope to a world that doesn't yet know God. Today, the people of God still need to remember that we are created to do good works so the world knows that God is good. It's about God. When, when we have a moment, it's about God. So con consider the words from Micah 6. What does the Lord require? I like to say it like this, to practice justice, to favor mercy, and to walk in a way that brings glory to God. You can't market social ties, social ties, and you can't market good feelings, and you can't market compassion. But when the Spirit of God is deep within you, you resemble the God whose image you're created in, and that means you practice justice. You give mercy. And when you do that, God is glorified. While the heavens declare the glory of God, humanity is created to reflect the image of God. And that's why the Wesleys describe the Christian life not merely as entering into relationship with Christ, but Wesley takes seriously the disciples' community holding one another accountable to following Christ. And this is our participation in God's gracious renewal of our lives to the image of God. That's how we, by the power of the Holy Spirit, are holy as God is holy. Our lives are edited by Jesus Christ. We are different in the world. So our resume looks like Jesus' resume. And consider what Jesus' resume looks like. When Jesus forgives the woman caught in adultery, that mercy, that act of kindness, judges the unrighteousness of the men who wanted to stone her. When Jesus reached out in grace and touched the leper, that mercy judged those around who ignored their pain and loneliness. When Jesus said to the little children, come, that mercy judge the impatience of the adults who want it quiet and order. When Jesus forgives sins, those who refuse to forgive and want to harbor anger are judged. God's mercy is God's justice. And that's how we can sing Zion songs in a foreign land 
We participate as members of a community who offer peace, who offer hope, who offer mercy, who practice justice so that the world gets to see a glimpse of God's intended kingdom, a place where there will be safety and there will be wealth and it will be distributed enough for everyone and there'll be ethnic diversity there and there'll be healing there and there'll be no more racial division and there'll be healing of economic classism and healing of gendered sexism the healing of nations now reconciled, the healing of hearts now forgiven, the healing of the body no longer division, disfigured by handicap, injury, or disease. No hunger, no thirst, no outcast, no one ignored, no one forgotten. All those who conquered will be there. This is what God is promising us. This is the life that is set for all the world. And until Christ comes again, we are to be a glimpse of that good. That is the work of our hands so the world knows that there is a God and he is good. Amen. A creative, imaginative, inventive idea. Memorable. And there's another way to understand that's what it means to be favored. By no merit of our own. God gives preferentiality to us. These are God's plans for our future. God's refrigerator is the world God created good. And your presence is an indication that God hasn't given up on that creation project. So don't just sing powerful songs here. Don't just shout here. Let your resume be not words on a paper of a certificate stashed away in a drawer, but let your resume be the persons that you encounter on Wednesday in Walmart and on Thursday in Target who say, you make me want to believe what that preacher said last Sunday. Thank you for favoring me because I needed that smile. I needed that act of kindness. Though you don't know my name, you are a stranger to me in this public place. But my preacher said there's a God who favors me. You must be a part of that community. Let that be your resume. Let that be the justice you practice. Let that be the good you do in the world. And may the favor of the Lord our God rest upon us to establish the work of our hands. Yes, the work of your hands. That they would be memorable, creative demonstrations of what the Lord God is doing to set the world right again. Tweet that and the world will know God is good. Pray with me. God, we want to be peculiar as you are peculiar. We want to be demonstrations of your good. We want the world to be shocked that we forgive and that becomes your act of justice against those who refuse to forgive. As best as we know ourselves, God, we want to be glimpses of your glory. So use us. Let our lives be demonstrations that you are willing to put up on your refrigerator that the world will know you've touched us and you love them. This is our prayer for the sake of the world Jesus died for. Amen. Go into the world. Be the handiwork of God. Live so that God's work is on the refrigerator of his creation. Amen.